All right, welcome everyone. Welcome so much. Uh, welcome so much. Welcome. I'm very happy to have you here in our class tonight where we will be going over basic medical terminology. Before we get started, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ariella Knight. I am the founder and CEO of the American Institute, which is an English language school and a cultural center based in Algiers. I'm an American. I am originally from Boston, Massachusetts, and I have been living and teaching English in Algeria since 2018. So I'm coming up on six years here in Algeria and hopefully many more to come. So what is happening right now? What is this program? Why are we giving a medical English course? Well, this is actually a course that the American Institute offers in partnership with the US Embassy. So the US Embassy is um, eager to spread English, especially specific types of English to all corners of Algeria. And so we have been uh, in this partnership running a series of courses since uh, last fall. So the total number of courses that we will do together are five. This is number four. So we've already done a course on applying to jobs. We completed this one. We completed a course on how to pass the TOEFL exam. And now we're actually running two different courses at the same time. So this is one that will be taking place every Sunday night at 6.30 p.m. on the topic of medical English. We'll be running six uh, sessions. So it'll be taking place over the course of six weeks. And every night or every Sunday night from 6.30 to 8, we'll have a slightly different topic related to medical English. Um, the course that's happening concurrently or at the same time is taking place on Wednesdays. So hopefully some of you are also in that course because these are very complimentary. This one is about medical English and the course on Wednesdays is about business communication and business soft skills. Anyways, that is sort of an overview. Um, here in front of you, what you're looking at is the full program of this course. We have six sessions, as I said, and you can see the dates um, on the far right-hand corner. So we will be together every week until June 23rd. The topic is medical English. What does that mean? What is medical English? Why are we? Uh, why do we even have something that is called medical English? Well, there are there are many different things that we can explore together, but these are the six that we have chosen. So today is going to be an introduction to basic medical terminology. Next week we'll be communicating in the medical field, doctor-patient communications, best practices. The week after that will be about conducting and reporting medical exams. Then we have a week on writing prescriptions and medication management. So if anyone here is a pharmacy student, pharmacology student, that would be perfect for you. Um, but also anyone in the medical field will have uh, touch points with prescriptions and medicine. Then we have vocabulary for mental health, specifically looking at not the physical side, but the mental side of healthcare. And lastly, looking at conferences, events, presenting research, introducing maybe networking um, as a medical professional. So that is our program. And I'm so excited to lead this with you today. We have a few rules for the course, not very many. We are together for an hour and a half. And we uh, hope we, we being myself, I'm talking in the royal we, um, I encourage you to participate. I have uh, questions on the slides I'll be asking you. I have questions that I'll just be asking you as your trainer on the course. And I hope that you will send answers into the chat. Um, we do ask that you stay appropriate and that you stay on topic. So in the next hour and a half, let's chat everything and anything related to medical English. This course is the first time I've had to put a disclaimer because usually I'm teaching topics that I have a stronger background in. So they're more closely related to business, uh, English, business skills, uh, networking, these types of things I know like the back of my hand. That's an expression to mean that I know them very, very well. Um, otherwise it's test prep, things related to the English language. When the embassy requested I do a medical English course, I was extremely excited. I'm ready to see where learning the English language can help medical students or medical professionals uh, further their careers. But I also felt the need to clarify that I am not a medical professional myself. 
So I'm going to be introducing you to medical terminology. A lot of what we're going to be going over is vocabulary that we use in English, but I will be relying on you to correct me if I misunderstand something about uh, a medical fact or something from uh, equipment to hospitals to conditions. So I'm hoping that you feel empowered to share with me. You know, I won't take it the wrong way if you say, Ariella, thank you for the English. However, that device you're pointing to is actually not the right one. It does X, Y, and Z. So this is not a medical class. This is a class about language, and I will be relying on you guys to help me. And I can see in my webinar that we have a doctor, a pharmacist, a medical biologist, medical student, microbiologist, a pneumologist, a pharmacist. Marhaba bikum. I'm so happy you're here um, to learn with me and also so I can learn from you. Um, and I hope that in, in the course of this class, I will increase my medical uh, knowledge as well. Um, so here's what we're gonna go over today. Basically some very, very basic medical language. Um, some things you probably have encountered before, others I hope will be new and interesting. We'll be looking at anatomy, physiology, not the whole body. We're not gonna go over every single body part, internal, external, just the big ones. Start to get a taste for the different types of vocab we have in English. We'll talk about uh, symptoms, complaints. Uh, I think today we're talking about uh, pain sensations. Um, and then common illnesses and medical departments and medical equipment. But this vocabulary focus is something that today we're doing almost exclusively vocabulary, but even in the other sessions that you see for the rest of the six weeks, we'll also have a strong vocab focus, including things like communicating with doctors or talking about mental health. Um, and I'd like to take a second to talk about that quickly. Uh, when people are saying to you medical English, this is my question for you. What do you think it means? What does it mean to you when someone says medical English? When you tell someone you're taking a seminar online on medical English, what does that mean? Send me answers in the chat. What do you think medical English is? Okay, Soraya says terminology. Yasin, I'm learning how to communicate as a doctor in English. Okay, medical terminology, terms are specific, vocabulary related to medicine, just terminology, how to talk with the doctor in the hospital, medical field vocabulary, English used in the field of medicine. Great, awesome, thank you for the participation. I see many answers coming in. Yes. Uh, basically, you have it. I like the one that says uh, English used in the medical field. So medical English covers everything from uh, the culture of an English speaking hospital, sort of the types of um, you know, when we when we talk about language, it's never alone. There's also a culture behind how do we politely make requests? How do we offer a correction? How do we um, ask for a partnership? So some of that will touch on culture, but the majority of a specialized English topic, I saw someone mentioning ESP, English for Specific Purposes. In most cases, an ESP course is really about special terminology or special vocabulary. And so a lot of what we're gonna be going over today, you know, we'll do different scenarios. Oops, I didn't mean to turn the page. We'll do different scenarios. Um, we'll hopefully get some practice from the folks attending, even on microphone. But I do wanna say that a lot of what we're gonna cover over the next six weeks are basically vocabulary terms. All right, and I want to encourage you, in addition to attending this class, to consider, if you haven't already, um, to consider watching medical TV shows in English, because this is also where you'll encounter not just terminology, but also language used in hospitals, language used between doctors and patients. Definitely in a TV show, it's going to be a little bit dramatic. It's going to be a little bit exaggerated, um, but it's probably one of the best ways besides being in a hospital um, to understand the kind of English that we use in these settings. So I see someone mentioned in the chat, the good doctor, I was gonna mention Grey's Anatomy, we have ER. Medical dramas are basically 
everywhere along. We have police dramas and medical dramas in English. And so I really think that this is one of the best ways that you can start to just attenuate your hearing. So that means getting used to hearing English terminology in hospitals. Cool. All right, now let's get to it. Medical language fundamentals. So this is an outline of the different elements of medical English. We have tools, physical devices. We have uh, co communication or conversations between patients and doctors. Uh, we have conversations between doctors to doctors or between pharmacists and anesthesiologists and physicians and surgeons. And then we have the language that we um, use in research papers, as well as when speaking to patients about diagnoses, about illnesses, about anatomy. So this is kind of the four different areas that we'll be covering throughout the length of the course. We're going to start today with looking at some basic terms related to anatomy and physiology. So first of all, we're looking at four different systems and we're gonna define systems, which I think if you went to medical school, you probably started with something this basic as well. So a system is referring to a group of structures that work together to perform specific functions in the body. And they're often named after the primary function they perform. We are going to be talking about four systems. Who can guess the four uh, body systems in English? I want to see if we have anyone online who already knows some of these. Cardiovascular, Nadir, awesome. Digestive, maybe. Neurologic, maybe. Cerebral. Any other guesses? Gastronomy, neurologic, respiratory, cardiovascular, urinary, neuro, 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 I see neurologic, I think you meant neurologic. Immune, okay, let's look at them. Thank you. So we have uh, John, apparently this here is John who we're gonna work with and he has four main symptom uh, systems. So cardiovascular, great. I saw cardiovascular right away. I saw respiratory, also great. The ones I didn't see mentioned yet, we have muscular and we have skeletal. So if you studied medicine, I'm sure you know what all of these mean, but perhaps you didn't have the word for them in English. So we're gonna look at very, very basic terms in each of these. So in the respiratory system, let's see what we have. I think some of these words are known by everyone, but we still included them. And some of them hopefully are a little bit newer. So mouth and nose, obviously we have these in the respiratory system and how we're breathing. We have sinuses. The sinuses are behind uh, the nostril. This is where you get an infection. They can travel into the inner ear, the sinuses. We have the larynx, the lungs, and the diaphragm, which is on the chart with John, right underneath his lungs. All right, take 30 seconds to look at it. We're gonna start quizzing right away. Okay. Um, tell me what was the lowest part of the respiratory system, the lowest down on John's body? Diaphragm, cool. And the highest up, the highest up, closest to the top of the head, there were three. Nice, nose, mouth, sinuses. Great. Um, what do we use to breathe? What do we use? Lungs. I suppose we also use our mouth and our nose, but I'm breathing, I'm showing the inflation of my lungs. Great. And there's only one left I didn't mention yet. Which one is it? Larynx. Very cool. All right, moving on. We are now looking at the digestive system. We have, again, the mouth, and then we have the pharynx. We have the liver the stomach and the intestines. I have to look up pharynx because I looked it up before and now I don't remember it, but maybe someone in the group remembers what the pharynx is. Oh yeah, it's the swallowing. It's the thing that helps you swallow. <laughs> so this is when not being a medical professional, 
uh, comes into play. So we have the mouth and the pharynx, which is a, a muscle that helps you with swallowing that can become affected by throat cancer. All right, we have the liver. What is the function of the liver? All the doctors in the chat, can you tell me what does the liver do? If you're familiar, if you've heard of the liver, what does it do? I'm looking for some answers in the chat. Storage of glucides, enzymes, all right. Met metabolism, insulin, enzyme production. Ooh, I'm getting some technical terms. I can't even fact check this. Gluconeogenesis, glycogen storage. Yeah, I'm seeing purifies the blood. This is a little bit more my level of knowledge, which is basically when people, if, you know, someone who hasn't gone to medical school, if they, if someone asks me what does the liver do, I would say it cleans. It helps cleans toxins. But I'm happy to learn from others that the liver does so much more than that. Nice. Thank you, everyone. Then we have the stomach. And lastly, we have the intestines. We have two types of intestines. We have the big intestines and the small intestines. Uh, who knows which one is on the outside in the picture? Is it the big intestines or the small intestines? The one that's outside. All right, everyone's getting it correct. The big ones. And inside we have the small intestines. And tell me if you went to medical school and you know, because I used to know the length of the small intestines. If you take them out of a person's body and you lay them out, I believe it's something like 20 feet of intestines, but maybe you know in meters. I'm not sure if this is a fact they teach you in medical school, but this is a fact that we uh, talk about I'm maybe in biology class in high school. Six meters, eight meters, wow. Yep, Yasin is saying the stomach arrow should be higher. You're right, Yasin. The stomach is 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 not accurately pointed at. At least this much I know. Yeah, the stomach is accidentally pointing to the big intestines. All right, great. Skeletal. We only gave you three points. Uh, I said points. Bones, joints, articulations. I'm gonna jump straight into muscular because we also only have three. We can say upper body and lower body when we're talking about muscles before we get into the really specific muscles of each part. And we talk about the core muscles. These are not uh, necessarily technical terms, but this is how we divide the muscular system into three main categories. And I think anyone who is into bodybuilding would also be familiar with these terms. All right, we're going to move on to false friends. Who knows what is a false friend? Tell me, what is a false friend in language? What is a false friend? A word that's common in two languages. Yes, a word that is common in two languages. Thank you but they don't actually mean the same thing. So here is our first example of a false friend. These are only with French. We haven't done false friends with English. Um, I believe that most people are doing their medical studies in French uh, in Algeria. I'm not sure if that's 100% correct, but I know that a lot of the scientific textbooks are in French. And so there's a familiarity with this terminology. So we decided to create an entire section that is about false friends from French and to English. So here are two different terms. You can see on the left, we have the French term intoxiqué. And on the right, we have the English term intoxicated. You can already tell from the pictures that we are giving you some hints, but can you tell me what do you think is the difference in the meaning? What is different uh, between, why, why do these words not mean the same thing? What does it mean in French? And what does it mean in English? Let's give it a shot. Well, Yasin and Layla kind of got it automatically, but I'm gonna give more time in case people wanna add something. Also very interesting that next year the medical studies will be in English. Great.
All right, let me show you. Yes, in French, intoxicated is a reference to food poisoning. I mean, it can also be just any kind of toxin, like your body has digested a toxin and you get very sick. Intoxicated in English is about alcohol or illegal drug use. Usually intoxicated is exclusive to um, drinking alcohol, but drinking too much, being drunk, um, losing your memory, falling over, that's someone who is intoxicated. Someone who's just had a few drinks and isn't showing these symptoms, they're not intoxicated. So there's a similarity because both uh, in French and in English, there's an image of someone who is not fully in control of their actions. But in French, it's really about having a toxin, a pathogen in your body. Whereas in English, we're talking about choosing to digest or somehow take in an illegal, well, a substance. Alcohol is a legal substance, but otherwise you can also use it for illegal drugs. So be very careful about these terms because they are not the same. Let's do another one. Appareil in French and apparel in English. What's the difference? Who can tell me what's the difference between these two? Apparel means clothes. Apparel are machines. Apparel are medical equipment, medical tools. Apparel is where you hang clothes. Okay, let's check. So apparel in a medical context is when we're talking about sort of medical devices, medical equipment. But apparel in English is actually not even a medical term. It's just another way of saying clothing. So it's not about the, um, the device where the clothing was hanging. It's actually a word for clothing. And you'll see it in really any context, general English. It's not at all a medical English term. But you will perhaps find, especially if you're translating documents, that if we remove the I from the French, that you might end up with a false friend or an incorrect translation between medical devices and clothing. All right, next. We have Jeanne and Jean. And I think Jeanne is supposed to have the accent in the other direction, if I'm not wrong. All right, what's the difference between these two? What do they mean? Jean is for our DNA. Jen is embarrassed, shy. Jen is awkward. Yeah, we have the wrong accent on the French, but you know, Malish, it's not a French class. As long as we have Jean correctly in English. Jean is for DNA. Awesome. Maybe it's the same. Let's see. So Jeanne in French means discomfort or bothered. That should say bothered like embarrassed. But uh, it has the exact same spelling as the word in English, gene, which is about our DNA code. We all have what's called a genetic code that makes up our DNA. All right. I think we have two more. We have attend and attend. This one is very important if you are going to be in a medical uh, context providing patient care. What is the difference between attendre in French and attend in English? Okay, I have folks telling me that in French you also say gène to talk about genes like uh, genetic genes, you, you use the same word. So that's very good to know. So in fact, it could, if it's used correctly, it could be the same word in both languages. Um, attendre is to wait and attend is to help. Attend is to be present, attend is to assist. Very cool. So attendre in French means to wait, but in medical English, this is all about helping or assisting a patient. In fact, when we have, um, doctors who are training and they're becoming uh, full doctors, you can hear them referred to as an attendant. 
that's actually a term that we would use for a doctor in training who's right towards the end of um, his or her residency. So attending uh, or to attend to someone in medical English is to take care of them, to check in on them, to check their IV, to ask how they're doing, to make sure they have their food. You can see in the picture here, we have someone attending to this older gentleman. And it always follows with the preposition to, to attend to. And I think this is our last one, drugs and drug. Drugs and drugs. What's the difference? Okay, the same. Someone's telling me they're the same. Some says medication, the same. Interesting. Okay, I see someone saying this is illegal substances. In French, it's illegal medication or medication we can we can become intoxicated with. Okay. Illegal medication. Yeah, I mean, you can even look at the picture. You can see that there's definitely similarities. There's definitely similarities between these two. So in English, drugs has two meanings. We more often talk about it as an illegal substance, um, but we also use it to refer to regular uh, medicine, prescription medication that we go to the pharmacy and we bring home. Um, again, it's more commonly used in, in a legal context, but it's, it still is frequently used in a non-illegal context. However, in French, we're seeing that this is only used to refer to addictive and illegal substances. Uh, so in uh, an English context, it's important to understand that you can use it for both. However, it's not always the most technical terminology. We would often use the terminology, my prescription or my prescription medicine, as opposed to drugs, but it can refer to both. All right, we're gonna move on from our false friends. This next section is gonna talk about symptoms and complaints in patients. So this is really, as I said, this class is really about vocab. Some of the vocab might be familiar. You might say this is really basic stuff, but I wanna make sure we have a strong foundation before we move into the next classes. Pain. Pain is when we are feeling something that hurts us anywhere in our body. We can have pain in our head, pain in our side, pain in our foot. We always have the preposition in. I have pain in an area of my body. All right, there's two types of pain that we can talk about. We talk about chronic pain. This is a condition, it's when you have a condition that never stops. It's been going on for years. It's something you learn to live with. It's something you manage. You manage your pain, um, but it is not from an accident. You didn't sort of scrape your elbow and it's gonna go away in a week. It is always with you. Acute, acute pain is just when you have something accidental that causes you pain, it fades and then khalas, you're done. So we always have a comparison between chronic pain and acute pain. Can you list for me some illnesses that are known to have chronic pain? I can start, I can think of um, uh, long COVID, long COVID. People who got COVID, back in 2020, 2021, even 2022, and they developed symptoms that have never left. So now it's been four years, they still have symptoms, now it's considered chronic pain. Diabetes, yes, people with diabetes struggle with chronic pain, definitely. Chronic sciatica, high blood pressure, so high blood pressure itself, I don't believe causes pain. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe there are some affiliated symptoms that are painful. Uh, cancers, yes, if you live with cancer for many years, you may have chronic pain associated with that cancer. Fibrosis, asthma, chronic re renal failure, hypertension, So Yasin is telling me you don't have any pain from high blood pressure unless it's giving you hypertension headaches. 
There we go. So chronic pain is not just a chronic illness. You can have a chronic illness, meaning that you are permanently um, managing an illness. You're permanently sick. Although I know some people don't like to say that. They say, I'm not sick, I'm managing uh, an illness. They don't wanna identify with the adjective sick. Um, so you can say, I have high blood pressure. That's a chronic illness. Am I in chronic pain? No, because every day, every week, I'm not waking up with something painful related to my illness. So I wanna be very careful that we know that chronic pain is related to a physical sensation. So I see someone here saying celiac disease. Celiac disease is perhaps a condition, but it is not a source of chronic pain because you can avoid eating what triggers it and then you won't have regular pain. This is what we call a pain scale. This is how, oops, there's a typo in the slide. It should not say severe, it should say severe. So please, in your minds, remove the first R. Mild to severe. So when you go to a hospital in the United States or anywhere where you're speaking in English, the doctors will ask you how strong or how bad is the pain. And you as the patient rank the pain saying it's an eight or it's a four. This is actually a tool that was developed relatively recently. I would say I started using or I started experiencing this in the early 2000s, maybe after 2010 even. And it's one of the tools that I think has really helped doctors understand and assess the um, real pain level that someone is in. Knowing that some people come in the door, they are completely calm, they're not crying, they're not upset, but they might be in the same amount of pain as someone who's really having a meltdown. So we are more and more often seeing a pain scale used. Is this something that you use in Algeria? Are there any doctors here in Algeria? Do you use a pain scale? And if you do, do you use from one out of 10? I see yes. It's called EVA. We use it with emojis. Very interesting. I see yes. I say I see no. There are many different scales. I see someone who said we call it auto evaluation scale. Oh, uh, EVA, auto evaluation scale. So in English, we're going to call instead of auto, we're going to call it self evaluation. I'm going to send that self evaluation. Great. Uh, wonderful. So what are the types of pain that someone can experience? Um, these are different types of symptom words, throbbing, a throbbing pain. This is going to be something where it feels like it's pulsing, okay? Pulsing or beating, regular uh, sensation of it going in and out, up and down. So a migraine, it's not necessarily just a constant headache. You can feel like someone is hitting you over and over and over. A toothache, and I want you to notice because these are also good and valuable um, vocabulary words, toothache. Um, a toothache is when your tooth is hurting, usually because you have some kind of infection and it's touched the nerve. And instead of feeling like a singular pain, you'll feel a pain that comes and goes regularly. We call this throbbing. Throbbing pain is usually for inflammation and in places where you're going to have pressure changes in the tissue. All right. Throbbing. Who here has ever had throbbing pain and what gave you that throbbing pain? Tell me in the chat. Migraine, finger infection, ouch. Toothache, migraines, a fever, wow. I see someone saying heart beating, okay, but your heart beats regularly. That's fine, that's not painful. Uh, but sometimes throbbing pain, if you've had it, you can relate to this. Sometimes it does feel like it has the same tempo as your heart or as your blood is pulsing, you can feel it going through your migraine. Pancreatitis, abscess, diabetic feet, headaches, fingernails when cut badly. Okay, so we have some folks in the group who have had throbbing pain, back pain. I think for me, when I think throbbing pain, I think um, I think headaches, 
headaches and migraines. I'm trying to think of anything else throbbing. No, not for me. Anything can throb, but most commonly we're going to talk about thro uh, throbbing pain with our heads. Next, we have burning, a burning, a burning pain, a burning pain. Excuse me. This is a burning sensation, typically associated with nerve damage or neuropathy. What does it mean, neuropathy? Who knows? Neuropathy in the chat. Lesion of the nerves. Wow. Yeah, I was gonna go, yep, pathology related to nerves, nerve damage. Yep, and sometimes it can even be happening when your nerves are dying, right? Uh, there can be conditions where your nerves start to go offline and it will feel like it is a burning sensation. So the image that you're seeing is showing how the sensation feels, but it is not just about burns. In fact, it's usually not about burns. It is about nerve pain where you will feel a sensation in your fingers or in your toes anywhere that you're having this kind of um, nerve damage. Tell me in the group, have you ever had a burning sensation? And if so, where? Where was the burning sensation? Yasin is saying a heart attack can give you a burning sensation. Ouch. Fingers, arms. Mm-hmm. Stomach, ouch, a burning sensation in your stomach. I mean, I would also say that we've had a, you can have a burning sensation if you're stomach sick um, and you have acid in your throat or in your esophagus. This also can provoke a burning sensation. It's not associated with nerves. It's associated with stomach acid. Okay. Third degree burns because they might reach the nerves. Zona, Zona gives a burning sensation. Oof. Okay, I never want to. I never want to get that. All right, next, radiating. So when we talk about radiating pain, you can think of it truly like a, a bunch of radiuses of circles that move out, 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 out like this. So usually the pain has a source, and it feels like it's spreading. So you will see this in sciatica. And again, we're talking a lot here about nerves because that's also where we're feeling our pain. So this is what we would call radiating pain. It starts in one place and it feels like it is spreading beyond where it began. So give me some examples if you've ever had radiating pain. Okay, Soraya is saying in heart attacks, you get this radiating pain. Back pain, I think that's a big one for radiating pain. Let's say you slip a disc right? You, you feel in the back that something is wrong and that pain extends into all the surrounding muscles. Someone is asking me here, it looks like Nihad, can we say pain? Oops, I just lost it. Can we say pain migration as radiating? Well, radiating pain would still hurt at the initial part. So radiating pain, it starts in the center and it spreads, but you still feel it in the original place. Pain migration would be where it starts in one place and fully moves. So you no longer have it in the original place, but you have it in a new place. So migration is a full departure. Radiation is a spreading where it stays in the source and it hits you in other locations. I see colon pain, herniated disc, sciatica, arthritis, IBS, muscle spasms. Heart attack gives this radiation into your arms. That's right. Testicular torsion, rheumatism, tooth pain. Yeah, great. I guess the medical English class is just talking about all of our uh, maladies, which is something we do say in medical English. I know it's a French word. In medical English, we will say it with an, uh, an English accent, maladies, uh, to mean illnesses. So next we have cramping. So cramping, this is all about your muscles. Usually you're having a muscle spasm where your muscles are contracting very tightly and it's extremely painful. It can feel like a tightening. It can feel like a squeezing. It can feel like a locking. Um, you will also hear about this for menstruation when women get their periods. We call these menstrual cramps. All right, when, when your period comes once a month and you have a huge cramping sensation in your lower stomach. 
Um, you can also experience stomach cramps when you're having gastrointestinal issues, food poisoning. It can feel like your stomach is just cramping in on itself. And then anyone who does any sort of physical exercise, especially running, um, will have a, a, a strong familiarity with muscle cramps, where if you don't stretch, if you don't uh, ice or take a bath or something to relax the muscles at a certain point, they may seize and cramp. Um, I have something to share in the chat about a very funny name for a type of cramp, but let's hear about you. Where have you experienced cramping pain before? Yeah, period cramps. Absolutely. Practicing sports. COVID. Someone got cramps during COVID. Interesting. I didn't hear about that as a symptom. Uh, swimming. Swimming will also give you these types of cramps. I believe it. I wonder if it would give you those cramps maybe in your legs or in your arms. Running cramps after your first day in the gym. Yep. Soraya is sharing that magnesium is good for cramps as well as keep losing the message because folks are chatting, which I'm happy to have the contributions. Magnesium and calcium. Thank you, Soraya. Yes. I, when I was uh, in high school, I was on the running team and I would get cramps in my calf, in my calf, which is the lower part of my leg. And I would just start eating bananas. That's what they would tell you. Eat bananas to get rid of cramps. Imad is sharing that dehydration could cause cramps as well. Gastroenteritis. Uh, gastroenteritis. Absolutely. Um, okay. And Sabrina actually says that you get cramps when you're sleeping. So there is a type of cramping that we have a very funny name for, and it is called a Charlie horse. I have no idea where this came from. I'm going to give you an example in the chat. I got a Charlie horse last night. A Charlie horse is when your calf muscle seizes. So the calf is the lower part of the leg and it seizes in a position where it locks your leg together. So the lower part of your leg kind of freezes fully and it's extremely, extremely painful. And it usually happens while you're sleeping. And then you are woken up by a sharp pain in your leg um, and you have to essentially lie in bed. You can try to massage your leg, but you really just have to wait for the cramp to pass. Um, so that uniquely in your calf is called a Charlie horse. This is not a technical term, but it is a language term that we use and it doesn't apply to any other part in your body. Um, yeah. I see neck cramps. I've also gotten foot cramps. If you've ever had your toes kind of like go in a weird, like they lock in a weird position kind of, I'm trying to imitate it here um, and your foot is cramping up. Okay. Your hand can cramp. If you're writing for your exams and your hand cramps, like the muscles start to feel tired and they start to kind of seize a little bit, you get pain from a hand cramp. So it doesn't have to be an enormous amount of pain to be cramping. It can still be a cramping pain. All right, I think that's it. Who can remind me of the types of pain? We had four. What are the four types of pain we just talked about? Throbbing. Yes, okay, we did talk about the difference between chronic and acute. Thank you, Yasin. That is correct. We have chronic pain and acute pain. But when we're talking about sensations, we talked burning, throbbing, radiating, cramping. Nice. Good job. Happy to see you're with me. Throbbing, burning, radiating, and cramping. Great. All right, now we're gonna go to common illnesses. And again, this is a very short list because there are many illnesses. And um, every week we'll try to add some more vocabulary here, but this is just going to be our baseline that we start with. So first we have hypertension, also known as high blood pressure. We use these terms interchangeably. Uh, it's something that doctors will say, but also patients are familiar with because I think similar to Algeria and other countries, it's extremely, extremely common to have high blood pressure. Then we have diabetes and we have two types of diabetes, type one and type two. And I know this is the same in Algeria that Algeria also has some increasing rates of diabetes. Who in here is a medical professional and who can tell me the differences between type one and type two? I'd be curious to see if they're the same in English. Type one diabetes, type two diabetes. What are the two different types? 
Okay. Yes, it's related to insulin. Good. Type one is for young people. Insulin. Type one uses insulin. Okay. Type one autoimmune, insulin dependent. Type one, the body cannot produce insulin. One has to take pills. Number two has to use penicillin. Type one is insulin dependent. Type two is usually for adults. Type two is usually for older people, older than 40. Non-insulin dependent, insulin resistant in type two. All right, I like this crowdsourcing. I'm getting little bits and pieces from everybody. Uh, someone is saying one is genetic, the other is due to obesity. Well, we can definitely say, again, I'm not a doctor, so this is not sort of a medical definition, but I wanted to make sure that in um, the Algerian medical establishment, we have the same differentiation between the two different types. So we have type one, which is usually the one that folks are born with. When they're children, they can have type one diabetes and they struggle to produce insulin. Uh, type two is usually the type of diabetes that you will get if you're living a not very healthy lifestyle. Um, and so you will get it later in life. This is a non-scientific -scient definition. Um, in the US, I can tell you that type two diabetes is on the rise because um, in America, we have a big obesity problem. And so type two diabetes is directly connected with being overweight or being obese. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Next, we have asthma. Asthma, tell me, is there a lot of asthma? For those who are practicing medical professionals, do you see a lot of asthma these days? I know we have nurses in here. We have medical students. All right, I'm getting a lot of yes. A lot of it, too much, especially in Algiers, uh, especially in spring. Oh, especially in pediatrics. That's a bummer. So yes, asthma, we can see it seasonally related to allergies. We can also see it as something that is chronic, that uh, children are just born having asthma, will have to uh, have an inhaler. This is called an inhaler, this device. I don't think it's on the next slide, so I'll just write it here. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, even like my brother when he was little, would have a breathing machine that he would use at night. And it's definitely something that can affect the quality of life. Yeah. All right, next we have cancer. So cancer, I think, um, is something almost like a world, uh, world language. We all recognize the word cancer, sadly, and we have many different types of cancer. So most of the types of cancers are going to be identified simply in English by the location. Brain cancer, throat cancer, um, uh, lung cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer, uterine cancer. Um, there must be much more liver cancer, breast cancer. Thank you. Prostate cancer. Um, what am I forgetting here? Uh, lymph, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, like lymph node cancers, yeah, blood cancers, bladder cancer, that's right, mm. leukemia is blood cancers, kidney cancer, I've never heard of, skin cancer, of course, yes, I should be familiar because I have very pale skin, it's a big concern, um, okay, all right, thank you, everyone. Next, we have um, anxiety disorders. I mean, this I've put here as a stand-in for kind of all the mental health disorders that are becoming increasingly common um, and increasingly diagnosed. So we can talk about um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, which stands for, which is uh, OCD. We can talk about um, depression, we can talk about anxiety, we can talk about panic disorder, we can talk about ADHD, we can talk about borderline personality, bipolar, um, yeah, PTSD, I see in the chats, panic attacks, mm -hmm. help me if I forgot any of the main ones, schizophrenia, let me see what else I'm not remembering, I said borderline, I mean, I think there's just the more uh, attention we start paying to mental health disorders, the more that we're getting clarity on the different types of ones. 
um, that exist. So I've just put them here as a marker because we will have our uh, mental health session uh, week five. And then high cholesterol. Ah, uh, yes, anorexia, anorexia and eating disorders. That's right. Um, okay, great. Oops. What do you think is the technical term for high blood pressure? I want to see if you can get this. The technical term for high blood pressure. Is it B or C or D or A? I see a little bit of everything. I have A, I have B, I have C, but I mostly have C. So the technical term is hypertension. I have a bonus point, which is what is the technical term for high cholesterol, which I was just quickly verifying on my phone that I have the right one, uh, but I believe I do. The technical term for high cholesterol is also on the list. Which one is it? All right, everybody got it, hyperlipidemia. In fact, we don't use this. So while we do use hypertension in a less medical setting, hyperlipidemia is something that is completely medical and you'll only be using that between doctors. All right. Now we're going to talk about medical departments, different medical departments in hospitals. I think, I believe that these medical departments will be somewhat similar to what you're familiar with because a lot of these words are Latin roots, and I think you probably use similar words in French. So before we get started, I want to see if you can list for me different medical departments. What are the different medical departments? If I go into a hospital and I look at the sign that tells me this department is this way, and this one is this way, and this one's on the second, the third floor, what are the different departments? Cardiology, surgery, neurology, radiology, ER, emergency room, podiatry, Pediatrics, thank you. Ophthalmology, dentistry, gynecology, stomatology. I mean, some of this you're gonna have to you're gonna have to check each other on because I don't know some of these. Maybe they are, um, but we're we're covering kind of our most basic ones on the next few slides. Dermatology, neurology, orthopedics surgery, radiology. All right, cool. So let's start. We have emergency medicine. All right, emergency medicine is a broad term talking about anybody who has an emergency when it comes to their medical care. So something to notice is that actually, and this is specific to um, the American medical system, we have something called urgent care and we have something called the ER or the emergency room. These are slightly different. Urgent care is for when you have um, symptoms that are urgent and pressing and you need to see a doctor, but you're not about to die. So you have food poisoning, you are, um, you know, maybe you have throbbing headache, you need medication. Let's say you have, you have a cough, you're unable to sleep. It is something extremely um, uncomfortable, maybe you have COVID. It's something uncomfortable. It's something where you need the care of a doctor, but you are not bleeding out to the point that something's gonna happen. You're not having a heart attack. An emergency room is for life-threatening, life-threatening injuries. And the emergency room is where if you are bleeding out of somewhere, if you've been in a sort of criminal, I don't know what could have happened with a knife or something, like that's emergency room. Bad car accidents, that's emergency room. Anything with a concussion, if you've fallen and hit your head and that can be life-threatening very quickly, that's emergency room. Um, heart attack, that's emergency room. Stroke, that's emergency room. But we've actually separated these two out. These are actually different physical locations. So most hospitals have emergency rooms. Urgent care are what we call clinics. They're outside the hospital, they're completely separate. The reason they have separated these is because everyone who had an urgent care problem, the person with COVID, the person with a really bad cough, the person with the throbbing headache, they were having a, a really hard time seeing a doctor. Maybe they were waiting six, eight hours because all these life-threatening injuries would come first. And so urgent care is a place where you can go if you have a problem that you need seen and you'll have a shorter wait time 
because there's no huge life-threatening emergency that will push you back to the line. Someone is saying the opposite is written here. Oh my gosh, the opposite is written here. Please ignore what is written. Urgent care is for life-threatening, urgent. No, no, this is the opposite. I'm sorry, it's a typo on the screen. The ER is for life-threatening and the urgent care is for urgent but not severe. I'll fix these slides before I send them out. Thank you to the person who pointed that out. I just looked at the chat and everyone's like, this is not what you wrote on the slides. Please ignore the slides. It is the opposite. Thank you so much. So ER is for life-threatening. Urgent care is for severe. Let's call it severe conditions. Thank you, everyone. All right, so that's emergency medicine, which encompasses emergency room and urgent care. Next, we have surgery. So this is the surgery. Usually it's a floor of the building. They'll call it the surgery floor. You will have a lot of different surgical specialties. So you can have general surgery, which is sort of everything, orthopedic, neurosurgery, we're talking about brain surgeons here, cardiovascular, maybe where they're putting a stent in your heart, working with uh, heart attacks, et cetera. Next we have anesthesiology. I believe people put that in the chat as well for one of the departments. I remember radiology, but I maybe I didn't see anesthesiology. So this is for people who are providing anesthesia, otherwise known as anesthesiologists. I can't say that 20 times fast. Anesthesiology, uh, and we'll leave it there. The people who provide anesthesia care before, during, and after surgical procedures. Although of course, anesthesia is used primarily to put you to sleep during a surgical procedure, but you will have a uh, consultation with uh, an anesthetist, Shaida, thank you for putting this in the chat, an anesthetist uh, before you go into surgery. Great. Pediatrics, this one you guys got, this was great. This is where um, you will find doctors who are concentrating on the care of children all the way up to uh, before age 18. And then we have obstetrics and gynecology. We actually call this in English OBGYN. So we are more common to pronounce it as an acronym of letters than we are to say the full name or even just to say gynecology. We will often say OBGYN and people will say, um, women will say uh, my OB. So they'll refer to their doctor, their gynecologist, or the woman who's going to, or the man, the doctor who's going to help them deliver their child. They'll refer to it as this person as my OB. So in this department in particular, we really use our um, uh, acronyms. I'm not sure why. Specializing in women's reproductive health, uh, childbirth, and care during pregnancy. Uh, urology, urologists for men. Internal medicine. So internal medicine is exactly what it sounds like. Everything related to diseases and things happening inside of the body. Often this is not related to surgery. So looking at different types of treatments that are non-invasive. Then we have radiology, which I did see that you got in the chat. Good. So this is about medical imaging techniques x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, uh, things to see what's happening either in the skeletal level or the muscular level in order to diagnose and treat your diseases. We have ophthalmology. This is all about eye doctors, making sure that you don't need glasses and also checking for other eye disorders. And then we have dermatology, deals with diagnosis of skin conditions and skin diseases. Psychiatry, so this is all about mental behavioral disorders. Neurology, this is about the nervous system. Cardiology, we're talking about the heart, cardiovascular, and pulmonology, which is looking at lungs and respiratory. Oncology, which is the cancer unit. Endocrinology, this is about endocrine system and hormones. Nephrology is all about kidneys. And that's it. Let's see how many we had there. I think there's a total of 10. And of course, you will find some that we did not include that you will still find in the hospital. But these were our main ones. Okay, we have emergency medicine, surgery, anesthesiology, pediatrics, oops, 
OBGYN urology. I'm at six. Internal medicine, seven. Radiology, eight. Ophthalmology, nine. Dermatology, 10. Psychi psychiatry, 11. Neurology, 12. Cardiology, 13. Pulmonology, 14. Oncology, 15. Endocrinology, 16. And nephrology, 17. Wow, Nadir, you already knew exactly what, what the number was. I'm very impressed. All right, I see um, Yassine asking about ENT. So this um, ENT, I think this is the French doctor that deals with uh, eyes, ears, and throat. Is that correct? Eyes, ears, and throat, ENT. Someone needs to translate this for me. Ah, ORL, yes, okay, ORL is in French. Yeah, ears, nose, and throat. So ears, nose, and throat. I mean, we have hospitals that specialize in ears, nose, and throat. I'm not sure exactly what department you would go to for this in the hospital. That's a very good question because we don't call it the ears, nose, and throat department. Um, it would have a more general name than that. I've never seen ENT in a hospital. O-R-L. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to look into it. I'm going to bring it next class. Maybe since I've left the U.S., they have ENT departments. Ears, nose, and throat. You will have an ears, nose, and throat doctor, but I'm just wondering what is the technical name of the department? Because usually all of these are going to end in the same code. Ology, ology, ology. Interesting. All right. I had another question up here. What about family medicine? Yeah, Layla, great question. So family medicine is also a type of um, practice that someone would have outside of a hospital. But family medicine is not a department within a hospital. So what we're looking at here are if you walked into a hospital, what are the different types of departments that you would find listed in um, like right next to the elevator, the floors, the, the the different sections of the hospital you can go to, the different types of doctors. When you're outside of the hospital, you will find different names for the doctors who have what's called private practice. So private practice is when you say to yourself, hey, I'm really good at what I do. I'm going to open up my own shop and have my own patients who come and see me. Maybe that's where you would find ENT. That's definitely also where you would find family medicine. That's where you'd find what's called a general practitioner or a GP. A GP is just the doctor that you go to once a year to check up and see that you're fine. Awesome. All right, quiz. What is the primary function of the emergency room? Routine checkups, treatment of minor illnesses, immediate treatment of life-threatening conditions or long-term rehabilitation. You guys got it. It is C, immediate treatment of life-threatening conditions. Answer in the chat, but you already did. And we're gonna go to medical equipment, which is our last section tonight. And we have 20 minutes, so I think we're great for time. So basic medical equipment. This here is a thermometer. We use it for taking body temperature. Next, we have something that until recently, a lot of people didn't know about this, but this is called a pulse oximeter. Can you tell me why now everybody knows what a pulse oximeter is? Can you think of why in the last four years or so, suddenly everybody knew what this was? Because of COVID, yeah, looking at the percentage of oxygen in the blood, this was one of the biggest signs if you should go to a hospital um, for advanced treatment when you had COVID. So these little clip-ons, I saw them in Algeria, I saw them in the US, you stick your finger in and you get your oxygen measure. Then we have a stethoscope. Uh, stethoscope, um, you can see in every sort of children's, um, if they wanna make believe that they're doctors, the mini ones, we have them, uh, you know, Still to this day in Algeria, everywhere in the world, in English, we call these stethoscopes. Then we have a blood pressure monitor. Um, we can also call this a cuff. Um, it's important to note though that we only call it a cuff when it's actually the wrap that you put around your upper arm. When you put it around your upper arm, then it's called a cuff. You can have other blood pressure monitors that are not cuffs, okay? But what you see in the picture is a cuff. 
All right, because you're wrapping it around yourself. That's what makes it a cuff. All right, these are different types of medical imaging equipment. We have an MRI and we have a CT. Who here has been in one of these machines? Who has had a CT scan or an MRI? Importantly, in English, we add the word scan to the CT. If you've been and you've had CT, we call it a CT scan. For an MRI, we don't add the word scan. We just say, I've had an MRI. All right, I see both, both. Not me, thank God, thank God, never. Me, MRI is very loud. So for me, I think I've been in the MRI, but only for my knee. So I have not been full body inside, which was what I uh, was happy to not have because it did look very scary. Wow, dark inside for 20 minutes. Yes, that sounds like, you must be very brave to go through that. Ah, Imad says, you're getting an MRI for your back tomorrow. Wow, amazing. CT, a CT stands for what? I actually don't know what either of these stand for and you're welcome to look it up and use it, but a CT scan is all that you need to say. Um, can the group help us out? What is MRI and what is CT? I think MRI is radioactive or radiating. C okay, Hakeem is saying CT is com computing tomography. Okay, interesting. Does anyone else know MRI and CT? Uh, magnetic radio imaging. Okay, great. And what about CT? Well, I suppose we can all look a magnetic resonance imaging, not magnetic radio imaging. Well, what is important for you in this moment, I'm happy that you are curious and you want to look it up, but what is important from a language perspective is that you understand what is an MRI and what is a CT scanner. Great. What do you call this? What is this? Who knows what this is? I see needle, I see syringe, I see injection, I see shot, needle, syringe, sting, needle injection, vaccine. Well, a vaccine can come from one of these. Injection, any other guesses? Anesthesia. Okay, all right. We call this a syringe. We also call it a needle. Be careful on the spelling of syringe. It has a Y, S-Y. Um, you can say that I got a shot. So for those who said shot or injection, that is the act of receiving the content inside the syringe. So you get a shot with a syringe. You get an injection with a needle. Okay, but the device itself is called syringe or needle. This right next to it, I didn't direct your attention to it. I realize that now, but this would be called a vial. This is the little glass tube that holds what is going to be pulled into the syringe. Great. What do you call this? I will accept two different terms for this one. I see cart, I see stretcher. I see question marks, stretcher, I don't know, wrong card, emergency, I call this an emergency, yeah. If you're seeing this, you are most likely in an emergency. Uh -huh, I see bed, oh, interesting. This one we're way less familiar with, okay. Because needle and syringe, a lot of folks knew what that was. Okay, I'm gonna show you now. So we call this a stretcher or a gurney. All right, it is what you will be brought into the ambulance with. If an ambulance is called to help you, you are injured, you are unable to get yourself to the hospital, you will be, it's called strapped into a stretcher. This is the verb, strapped into a stretcher or strapped into a gurney, okay? And then you can see that the stretcher is on wheels. So they wheel you 
into the hospital. This is the verb of the person who's pushing it. They wheel you into the hospital. Okay, so you as a person, when they're installing you into the stretcher, we call it to be strapped into. And then when they're pushing you in it, we say they wheel you because it is on wheels. Great. Who knows the difference between these two things? I want the difference of name, what are they called, and the difference of function. Since I know we have um, medical professionals here who have been explaining things to me all night, tell me, what are the differences between these two things? What do we call them and what do they do? I see ECG, I see EKG, EKG vitals, ECG. All right. Any other ideas? We have two different things here. They're both, uh, they both have a name, it's a different name, and they both have a different function. Electrocardiogram, okay. We have scope and chocks. Defibrillator, scope. Interesting, I've never heard this scope. Hmm. Defibrillator, electroshock. So Yassine, you're telling me that scope is for monitoring the patient's vitals and shocks delivering machine to deliver an electrical charge to the heart. Any other guesses before I show you? All right, to help the heart, heart pulse, to measure the electrical activity of your heart. All right, let's see. So we call these an EKG and before you ask, I do not know what it stands for, but I think our friends can help, probably something with electro. And then we have a defibrillator, a defibrillator. Who can tell me what does a defibrillator do? What do we use it for? I'm sure you've, if you're not a medical professional, but you're here with us, I'm sure you've seen this in movies where they go, and they put it on the body, right? They rub it together. Defibrillator, what does it do? It delivers an electrical shock to the heart. I'm gonna spell shock for you here. In English, we spell shock with an S-H, shock. Good. It provides an electric shock to the heart to relaunch the heartbeat, to restart the heart, to stimulate the heart. Great. What about an EKG? What does that do? Does it restart the heart? What is an EKG? Tell me in the chat. Okay, electrocardiogram, but what does it do? What is its function? Gives a reading, gives us the rhythm of the heart, diagram of the pulse, to see the cardio rhythm, to know the electricity of the heart. Interesting, very poetic way to write it. To measure the beats of the heart. It's very interesting because if you say to measure heartbeats, it sounds scientific. But if you separate heartbeats into beats of the heart, suddenly it sounds like you're writing poetry. So I, I'm smiling because I like poetry, but in a hospital, you're always gonna wanna say heartbeats, never separated into beats of the heart. And heartbeats is also going to be written as a single word to record electrical signals in the heart, okay? So we have one that is used for monitoring. Everything that you said is correct. Monitoring heartbeats, monitoring your cardiac rhythm. And we have one for what is called reanimation or for helping someone whose heart has stopped. Great work. All right, so we actually have finished a little bit early. I'm looking at the time. Do you have any questions from anything we've talked about? I'm gonna go back and look at the schedule for the rest of this week. And you can tell me if you have any questions about what is coming next. All right. Here we go. So next up, we have effective communication skills in the medical field. Again, this is gonna be patient to, stu to student, patient to doctor and then doctor to doctor, how people talk to each other in a medical environment. It's gonna include some things that are just general professional English as well as some other vocabulary. We then have conducting um, and reporting on medical exams. 
everything from your general checkup to using one of these uh, MRI or CT scans and the types of terminology around it. Um, then we have prescriptions, especially for those who are interested in pharmacy studies or pharmacology, this will be the class for you. We'll have vocab for mental health, everything related to mental health disorders. What is therapy? What's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist? Things like that. And then lastly, things about careers in the medical field. So going to conferences, going to events, writing research papers, what kind of terminology should you be familiar with in that space? Um, let's see. I see a question here from Yasin. There's a machine used in imaging using ultrasounds. Is it just called an ultrasound? Yes, it is. We call the machine an ultrasound, and we also say we got an ultrasound. I went to get an ultrasound. We just call it an ultrasound. I see. Can you tell us what are the different grades of doctors? You know what? That's a really great point, Sarah. Thank you. I'm going to add that into next section. What do we call um, a doctor who's just starting? We call interns. Um, when do they become residents? Who's an attendant? Um, who's kind of the doctor in charge of everyone else? Um, we can talk about nurses. We can talk about physician's assistants as compared to general practitioners. Um, and I see folks looking for when this will be posted on YouTube. This is a saved meeting. So we will have uh, this entire content up posted on the American Institute YouTube, hopefully by the end of the week. So I'll send this over to my team and we will get, um, we will get that online as soon as possible if you missed any part of this. Um, Yasin, you're saying there's a medical specialty I'm not familiar called medical assistant. What is it? Interesting. Um, we can talk about the different um, uh, sort of medical adjacent fields that are popping up in the United States, Canada, and the rest of the English speaking world that are not just classic doctors. I would say a physician's assistant is the most obvious sign of this. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about that culture next week. Thank you. All right, if we don't have any other questions, um, thank you so much for coming. Happy to have you here, and I will look forward to seeing you next Sunday. We will be doing medical English together every Sunday night at 6.30. You don't need to re-register, and you don't need a new link, okay? You will have an email sent to you to remind you the day before and the hour before. It's the same link every time, and it's open to everyone. Thank you for coming. Have a good rest of your evenings.